For home theater use, I think it's a good speaker. For stereo use, it, you're not buying this for stereo. I think, I think we know that now, right? Okay, good. Let's talk about the power sound audio. So PSA, as it's known in short, MT hyphen 110 hyphen M. Now the hyphen M at the end stands for matte because there is a version that is just MT hyphen 110 that is not a matte version. Uh, it's made in the USA, costs 1850 bucks for the non-matte version, but the matte version that I've got came from a fellow named Matt. Thanks, Matt. And these retail for $13.50 a pair. I'm gonna show you a video of the speakers inside, outside, while I walk you through a couple of the manufacturer specs. These speakers are a two-way loudspeaker. They are an Ohio built and finished cabinet. They feature a one inch polyamide compression tweeter, a cast aluminum exponential horn, 10 inch high efficiency neodymium woofer. Spec sensitivity is at 95 decibels at one watt, one meter but my measurements show something that is lower than that. We'll talk about that. Nominal impedance, eight ohm. The speaker is also a sealed speaker, so it is not ported. You don't necessarily have to worry as much then about putting it near a wall if space is a concern. When we talk about the compression driver and the horn, this is it. I took it out of the enclosure, see? And it is a B and C made compression driver. Next, we'll talk about the woofer. Also, what appears to be a BNC made woofer. A little nice neo magnet on the back. Stamp steel frame, it looks like. So, not a lot to write home about about the woofer, but you know, I don't get too hung up on the drive units as long as the sum of the total parts is executed well. Besides, BNC generally makes pretty good stuff, so it's a good name brand to start with. I do like the build quality of these speakers mainly because they used nut certs. These little things right here, right here, right there. Those little things, nut certs. Then you're not drilling directly into the wood. They go into the wood and then you use a threaded bolt and you just bolt the drivers into the nut certs. It's just a cleaner finished product and I appreciate when manufacturers do that. You can also see the enclosure is lined very well with some sort of acoustical stuffing. Now there's all sorts of different acoustical stuffing from egg crate foam to polyfill to you name it. I don't know exactly what they use. I'm not even going to try to guess, but it's some sort of stuffing. So that's a good thing. And finally, the crossover looks like it's well built. Nice, simple design. Doesn't have any of the boutique parts from Solin or Jansen, but overall, I'm not really having any concerns with what I see here. As far as my listening impressions, on the good end, there is very good dynamic range. I also like that the speakers were not fatiguing. They were not bright. Now, there are cases where wave guided compression driver speakers can be bright and fatiguing. And that's not because they're wave guided and it's the throat, it's the lower mid range. Actually what it is, is the upper frequencies are so constant that a flat on axis design can make a flat directivity design sound bright in room. Meaning that what you have coming directly at you in the higher frequencies is also directly reflected at you in the higher frequencies as well. And then that culmination of the reflected sound and the direct sound stacks up to sound more flat in room. And I don't like that. So that's one of the trade-offs about a good constant directivity design. This speaker doesn't have that flat in room high frequency response sound. That's a good thing. You don't want a flat in room response. I got a whole video about why that is. Click the card up here if you're interested in finding out. The sensitivity is reasonably high. It's about 92 and a half decibels at 2.83 volts, one meter. However, there are some frequency response anomalies that bothered me in my listening. And before I get into that, I'll say that I had to EQ those down. And in doing so, I took the headroom, if you will, from about 92.5 decibels to around 90 to 91 decibels. So I dropped some of the sensitivity that is already baked into the speaker itself. Now, it's really not a big deal, but it's just worth noting that when you use a speaker like this, you're probably gonna be using equalization to fine tune it and tweak it to get it to sound the best way that it can as your starting point before you even put it into a room, which is what I would suggest. And in doing so, you do then lower the overall sensitivity some, but it's still around 90 to 91 decibels, even with EQ placed to fix some of the things that I had issues with. So let's talk about those things that I had issues with. 
The mid range when my was so when I'm listening to speakers, what I do is always the same thing. I get the speakers, I set them up, I listen, I take notes, I then go put it on my clipple, I test it, I look at the results from the measurements, I compare my listening notes to the actual data, and I say, okay, what kind of correlations can I make? And if anything seems off, something doesn't job, then I go back and listen again. In this particular case, one of the first things I noticed was that the mid range just sounded thick. And I don't really have a better way of explaining what I mean. So what I'm going to do for you all right now is I'm going to EQ up the particular range that I thought sounded thick, and I'm going to let you hear the difference as I'm talking. So starting right now, my voice is thick mode. Now it's normal, and I'm talking, and I'm talking, and I'm saying words, and now it's thick mode again. Consider that whatever you're listening to me through may not be ideal. But whatever it is natively is your baseline. So when I go into thick mode with two Ks, um, that is the abnormality there. It's not ideal. And that's what stood out to me as a fault for these speakers. It just sounded like things were maybe too full bodied and not quite natural. Now, on the other end of things, literally, was the lower vocal region. It sounded too thin. And I thought, well, okay. And then on the upper end of things, again, literally, there was some detail and presence missing. And in my notes, I actually wrote down between two and four kilohertz with a question mark. And then when I looked at the data, I saw why. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The other thing is you've got to use a subwoofer with these speakers. It's just because it uses a 10 inch mid bass mid woofer doesn't mean it's going to get down to 50 hertz or even 60 hertz. Actually, in my room, I was lucky to get down to about 70 hertz. The F3 is at about 110 hertz, so it's already rolling off. Now, you may say, why is it rolling off so high when it's using a 10-inch midwoofer? Well, it's simple. They're trading sensitivity, they being B and C, are trading sensitivity for the roll-off. And they're just saying, hey, we want additional output capability, and therefore, we're going to sacrifice low-end capability. It's that simple. Without a subwoofer, yes, these speakers leave a lot to be desired, but again, it's imperative that you use a subwoofer. The people buying this speaker are gonna be home theater enthusiasts. I don't think two channel enthusiasts are buying this particular brand. If I'm wrong, let me know in the comments below, but that's my understanding. So what I did was I have a JBL 550P on hand that I'm testing right now. I used that and I played around in my room with positioning, found the best location, which was in the right corner, just a little bit out from the wall. And then I played around with the crossover. Now I started at 60 Hertz and I went up to 120 Hertz and just kind of played around in the area. What I landed on was between about 80 to 90 Hertz. That seemed to work the best for my needs and for the room. If you go lower than 80 Hertz, these speakers don't get low. I mean, they barely get to 70 in room on their own. So going lower than 80 Hertz to try to cross over to a subwoofer is too low. You're going to miss a lot of the impact. Make sure you stay between 80 and 100 Hertz will be my personal suggestion. Now that I've given you an idea of what I heard in my listening session, let's take a look at the data and see where we can find some correlation there. All of my measurements are done using the Clipple Nearfield Scanner, which is a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows me to get anechoic data from a speaker in a non-anechoic room. And basically what this allows us to do is to see exactly what the speaker itself is doing before you place it into a room. And that's really great information to have, especially when it's a speaker that you know that you'll be equalizing. For example, this speaker. So I can give you anechoic data and I can give you suggestions on where to apply equalization to smooth out its response. And then you'll have the best possible baseline before you even put the speaker in your room. This is the on axis frequency response and the listening window. Now, when I did my measurements, the microphone was referenced to the middle of the tweeter. Sensitivity is at about 92 and a half decibels, F3 at 113 Hertz, F10, at 68 Hertz. So like I said earlier, in my listening session in my room, the speaker barely got down to 70 Hertz with any sort of authority at all. That it makes sense. Now that I see the data, I'm like, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. F10s at 68 Hertz, meaning that it's 10 decibels down already at just about 70 Hertz from the mean sensitivity. What I would do is I would personally suggest you take parametric EQ, uh, maybe put around six, 700 Hertz, set a Q of about maybe three, drop it down two decibels. So another parametric EQ of around, let's say Q of about maybe two, two to three, somewhere in that region, and then drop that at around 1.8 kilohertz. 
by about two decibels as well. And what that will do is that will smooth out these areas right here, because those are the problem areas in my listening. And now we have the CEA 2034 data set, which is similar to what you just saw. I have the on axis in black listening window in green. And then down here, we have the early reflections directivity index. And the smoother this dash blue line is down here, the more EQable the speaker is gonna be. In this particular case, it looks relatively smooth. So it does indicate that you're gonna be able to equalize the speaker, but there is this dip around two and a half to three kilohertz. What is that? Well, that's the distance between the tweeter at the top and the woofer below it. That's center to center spacing, meaning that there's gonna be a hole in the response vertically. If you go above the tweeter line or below the tweeter line, there's gonna be basically a suck out. And that is what we have this dip right here for. But horizontally, it remains its directivity pretty constantly. This is the estimated in-room response, which gives us a good idea of the tonality of the speaker from the anechoic data. So before you place it into room, you can have a good idea of how it's gonna to sound tonally. And I will tell you guys, this matched up extremely well to what I heard. And there's a reason for that too. So let me walk through a couple of things real fast. Generally, what I try to do is I try to put a trend line on this estimated in-room response because this gives us an idea of, okay, it's gonna sound, maybe it's gonna sound laid back. Maybe it's gonna sound warm. Maybe it's gonna sound uh, like the mid-range is a little bit too boosted. Maybe it's gonna sound like it's treble heavy, those kind of factors. And like I said earlier, remember that you don't want flat in-room response. You want a toed down in-room response. And that depends on the speaker design. Again, whole video on that. I really encourage you to go watch that. In this particular speaker, what we see is basically two trend lines. You've got the standard trend line that I would have drawn right here, but then you've got the boosted mid range that's about two to three decibels above this standard mid line. And that's what I heard in my room. Now let me show you a couple little pointers. When I said I heard thin lower vocals, that's right in here. When I said I heard a thick mid range, that's this boxed in area right here. When I said I heard presence or detail missing, that's this dip right around two and a half to three to four kilohertz, right through here. Those line up to exactly what I heard. Now I've been doing this for, I don't know, 15 years or so. And I've tuned many systems by ear, uh, set equalization by ear, measurement, and then set equalization, I've done it all. And so that's given me a really good idea of when I hear something that I don't like or that stands out, I can usually get a pretty good idea of where it's gonna be just by listening. And then I can look at the frequency response and I can say, okay, that makes sense. In this particular case, this speaker and the results lined up exactly to what I heard and what the results predicted that I would hear. And then what I did is I went a step further. So I took the estimated interim response and then I measured the actual interim response from two different positions, one closer to the wall behind me and one a little bit closer to the speakers. And that's what I've got in this blue and green line. These are the actual interim response measurements. This red line represents the estimated interim response. Now in my experience, what happens above about 500 Hertz is the estimated interim response is pretty much right on. Below about four or 500 Hertz, the estimated interim response is gonna be off because the room is much more dominant of the sound that you hear. But what this does is it gives us an idea of, yeah, the actual anechoic measurements taken outside of the room line up pretty dang well with the actual in-room measurements. And we can see that there's this mid-range bump right through here. Then there's this dip in this presence region right here that aligns with the estimation. And then the response kind of just flows off a little bit. And then we've got a kick up around these 16, 14 kilohertz area. So all of these match, everything kind of makes sense. Now we're gonna move on to something that's a little bit more personal preference, radiation width horizontally. I like a speaker that's about plus or minus 50 to plus or minus 60, maybe plus or minus 70, somewhere in that window. Now that just means that there's gonna be a little bit more room involvement compared to a speaker that is a little bit more narrow. I would say this speaker is about plus or minus 40 to 50 degrees in the mid range. And as you go higher, it narrows up and it's about plus or minus 40 to 30 degrees up through the highest region. So I'm basically just tracking where this red is and just gonna get it a visual cue here. How did that align with what I heard? Well, I didn't feel like the speaker had a very wide radiation and kind of jives with what I'm seeing here now. Now, if we talk about the vertical radiation, where you want to position this tweeter, where you want to position the speaker so you get the best listening experience. And this really matters for those of you who have multiple rows. If you have a single row in your home theater, set the tweeter at ear level, call it a day. But if you have multiple rows, then you have to imagine that the people who are sitting behind you 
are probably not going to hear the same thing that you hear if the response changes as you move above that tweeter line. And in this case, it does when you get to about 15 degrees or so. So where this suck out is between two to three kilohertz, that's going to be a totally different sound in that region because the listener is going to be above the reference line. What this means is if somebody's sitting behind you, then they need to be within about that 10 to 15 degree window or their impression of your system may not be as ideal as your impression as you're sitting in the front row. Now there is a little bit of a trade-off. So it's possible that you could go maybe five degrees below the tweeter line for the front row, and then that'll gain you a little bit more on the back row. So you, you do have some room to play around with, but it's not a lot. Just keep that in mind. Distortion at 86 decibels looks really dang good. At 96 decibels looks really dang good. I mean, it's all below 1% above the mid range. And then below the mid range, you're between one and 3% down here, but it's, this is really good. Multi-tone distortion shows good response as well. There is increasing distortion in the upper mid-range area. That could just be because of the woofer. Maybe it's starting to break up. There are some issues that I noticed in the impedance sweep of the woofer itself, above about 500 hertz. So that kind of jives with what I'm seeing here, but this really isn't anything that I'm too concerned about. And then if I cross the speaker over at about 80 hertz, like I would if I were using it with a subwoofer, the distortion, Actually, it's quite similar. So I'm not gonna say that it changes a lot. It's pretty much par for the course here as well. Compression is where the speaker also shines. So the distortion and the compression are two areas where the speaker really shine. As I increase the volume from 76 decibels to 102 decibels, I don't want the frequency response to change. And if it does, then you'll see one of these lines have a deviation. If it doesn't, then each of these colored lines will be completely flat. Now there are some deviations at the highest output, but they're about half a decibel. Are you going to hear that? Probably not. Half a decibel of dynamic range loss is, in my opinion, completely acceptable when you're talking 76 decibel to 102 decibel or 26 decibel swing. That's completely fine. To sum it up, two main things. Use a subwoofer, use equalization. They don't get low, we know that. The equalization will help remedy that mid-range bump that makes it just sound way too thick and it will also lighten the effect of not having enough lower vocal and also not having that presence region that I missed. So when you drop that mid range down to match those other ends, everything will sound more linear and sound more neutral. For home theater use, I think it's a good speaker. For stereo use, it, you're not buying this for stereo. I think, I think we know that now, right? Okay, good. Two to three bands of equalization will do a lot of good for this particular speaker. If you have any questions about this content, anything about the data, what it's saying, feel free to ask me in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer when I can. If you would like to support this channel, you can do so at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. By joining me, you can get some behind the scenes information, some early looks at data, some early looks at reviews, polls, and things like that. I appreciate you watching and I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.